Welcome to another episode of Fear the Old Lore, where we examine the Japanese and English versions of Bloodborne to gain a better understanding of the lore. In this episode, we'll examine how what may have been Bloodborne's largest theme was lost in translation, and how the Elder's truth as we know it doesn't exist. There is a supernatural cosmic force within Bloodborne that's responsible for many unexplained phenomena. Coming into contact with it is dangerous and can cause people to go mad or transform into grotesque monsters. It can also grant inhuman knowledge necessary to transcend the beastly idiocy of man, yet it is a mystery, unable to be comprehended by mankind. When translating a large project over a period of time, it's easy to miss small details that are spread throughout a number of passages. In the Japanese version of Bloodborne, the term Shinpi is used extremely consistently to describe the supernatural cosmic forces of the arcane, yet it's translated over a dozen different ways into English. As a result, this has made certain elements of the game appear more disconnected than they really are, or worse, completely unrelated. Looking up Shinpi in a dictionary shows it means something along the lines of secret or mysterious, but as is often the case, it only gives a rough approximation of the word's meaning. A native dictionary reveals that Shinpi is something mysterious that defies human understanding. It's affiliated with sacred mysteries, which according to Wikipedia can mean either religious beliefs, rituals, or practices which are kept secret from non-believers or lower levels of believers who have not had an initiation into the higher levels of belief. The concealed knowledge may be called esoteric, or beliefs of the religion which are public knowledge but cannot be easily explained by normal rational or scientific means. Part of the reason I highlight this is because even though you can be familiar with something and confident you understand it, additional context can completely reframe what you once thought you knew. For example, at the 35 second mark when I said the arcane force of Bloodborne is a mystery, unable to be comprehended by mankind, I was giving the definition of Shinpi without the context for it beforehand. This retroactive eureka moment can happen surprisingly often in translation, where access to additional information can completely change one's understanding of a word, phrase, or more, similar to how the plot twist and the sixth sense reshapes the entire movie. Even if it was only a little, I hope I was able to recreate that feeling here since the rush of knowledge from an epiphany is similar to gaining insight. Because I'd been translating only a few passages at a time, it took me months before I realized that Shinpi was the term the developers used for the arcane stat. Once I'd made this discovery, I had an epiphany. Even though Shinpi does mean mysterious or divine secret, it's more related to a kind of cosmic magic that's unique to Bloodborne. Just like the localizers, I'd been translating it inconsistently too, so I had to completely revise what I'd been working on. Once I did, I began to see how much more connected various aspects of Bloodborne really were. To give a quick overview, here's a list of times Shinpi appears. It's still possible to conclude these are connected in English, but it's less clear and isn't definitive, whereas the Japanese casts away ambiguity by being more explicit. By recontextualizing Shinpi as being related to the arcane, we can gain a better understanding of the world of Bloodborne. For example, rather than Bergenworth encountering an abstract eldritch truth, they came into contact with the arcane, which is more concrete and connects to the other times Shinpi appears. According to Sedatives, Madman's Knowledge, and the Graveguard set, exposure to the arcane can lead to madness, yet it can still be a boon for future generations. Since Madman's Knowledge grants insight, and is obviously connected to madness, there may be a link between exposure to the arcane, going mad, and gaining insight. Two sources demonstrate such a relationship. The first time the player is grabbed by the amygdala near Erden Chapel in the Cathedral Ward, they will gain a point of insight after becoming a frenzied. The second is in the Nightmare of Menses. The corpses surrounding the brain of Menses have the highest concentration of Great One's wisdoms found in the entire game and they're all riddled with frenzy spears. Those who delve into the arcane fall all too easily to madness. And since sedatives can prevent it, we can infer that the corpses surrounding the brain of Menses were exposed to intense arcane energy. This caused them to go mad and they gained immense insight at the cost of their lives. Truth oft resembles madness, and the same is true of cold blood. As it becomes more densely concentrated with blood echoes, it takes on a more frenzied appearance, and in Kin Cold Blood, we begin to see traces of the arcane Bergen were touched upon long ago. Because Kin Cold Blood calls Shinpi the Eldritch Truth, it's more difficult to connect it to the arcane in what makes frenzied cold blood frenzied. By the same token, it's much more difficult to connect Carol runes to the arcane since the rune workshop tool describes them as having wondrous strength. 
However, this phrase is even handled inconsistently in English. The first time the memory altar is accessed with the Rune Workshop tool, a prompt will appear on screen and say memorize a carol rune to acquire its Eldritch Strength instead of Wondrous Strength. It's not terribly surprising there's a discrepancy since items and notes would have likely been translated at separate times or by separate people. Semantically, Wondrous and Eldritch are close in meaning and both are decent ways to interpret Shinpi. The issue is, it's given more meaning beyond its dictionary definition, so even if they're technically accurate translations, they don't preserve the full context of the original. Another instance of Eldritch being used to describe the arcane can be found in the third umbilical cord obtained from Ariana. It states, It was corrupted blood that began this Eldritch liaison, and reveals it's because of the impurities within Ariana's blood that the liaison with the formless Great One Erdin is possible. As a great one that exists in both blood and voice, Erdin likely doesn't discriminate between what it comes into contact with. Both the Chapel Dweller and the Little Girl have the formless Erdin rune, and Adela and the Imposter Doctor can both have the Erdin Writhe rune. In earlier builds of the game, the Erdin Writhe rune was called the Erdin Liaison rune, and may suggest while Erdin is present in the Chapel Dweller and the Little Girl, they may not be anatomically able to have a liaison with. From what we know of Ariana, Adela's blood might not be corrupt enough for a liaison with Erdin capable of producing a child, and the case of the Imposter Doctor is often contested. Some have argued the Imposter Doctor's third umbilical cord may have come from Bergenworth since it talks about Headmaster Willem, but I'm skeptical of this claim. If we encounter her before the Red Moon is revealed, she drops the Erdin Rytherun, and there's no sign of an umbilical cord in either the clinic or Bergenworth, which raises more questions than it answers. It seems more likely her cords of description is generic, and that Willem sought them indiscriminately. Additionally, we find the Imposter Doctor is in a birthing position after the Red Moon is revealed, suggesting she may be pregnant. It's unclear if her situation differs from Ariana's, or if she's truly been chosen and is becoming a great one herself. It's unfortunate we don't get to see the final result of her metamorphosis, but either way, her having the Erdin Rytherun does show there is a broader connection between herself, Erdin, and Ariana. Erdin exists in voice, and items like the Choir Bell, Beckoning Bell, and the Old Hunter Bell show that sound has the ability to carry arcane power and cross planes of existence. In Buddhism, bells symbolize the wisdom of Buddha and heavenly enlightenment, and their timbre is thought to be capable of reaching the underworld. In Shintoism, bells are used to attract the attention of Kami and ward away evil. It's uncertain how much either religion influenced the design of Bloodborne, but bells are given special significance by the Healing Church and the Thumerians. With their sounds able to bridge the gap between worlds, it's easy to see why. However, the chimes of bells are not the only example of sounds links to arcane power. You may want to adjust your volume to a more comfortable level before continuing. The moderate whistle can summon a giant snake from the nightmare, carol runes are phonetic representations of Great One's voices, and the voice of the crying child in the fight with Queen Yarnum can paralyze the hunter. What may be the most shocking example of an arcane sound is the existence of a kind of chiming in the blood. Unlike Adela, Adeline, or Yosefka's blood vials, if one uses the blood of Ariana, a faint chiming sound accompanies it for a brief period of time. Considering that Ariana's blood is closest to the formless Great One Erdin, who exists only in voice, this chiming sound might be meant to indicate her blood is of a higher quality than the others, and thus closer to Erdin. This sound of bells or chimes extends beyond blood, and can be applied more broadly to the arcane in general. While it's easy to initially dismiss, coating a weapon with the arcane slime of the empty phantasm shell will cause it to chime faintly over a dull ringing sound. A similar ringing can be heard from the HP draining aura of a brightest daughter of the cosmos, and the HP draining attack from Queen Yarnum in the Chalice Dungeons. Being grabbed by a Garden of Eyes also produces a distinct chiming sound, but it can be difficult, if not downright painful, to hear between their insectoid screeching. And finally, this characteristic chiming sound can be heard when channeling blood echoes into the doll to level up, or performing a ritual to open a Chalice Dungeon. The choir likely recognized the significance of sound, and their name may have been an homage to its divine properties. It has more secular connotations in English today, but choir comes from Seikatai, which literally breaks down to Holy Song Group. 
Obviously, choir still captures this meaning to a degree, but it's curious if their name is supposed to allude to the kind of holy song present in high quality blood or the hymn like noise produced by the Rosmarinus. Aside from sound, the arcane also has connections to the sea which serves as a metaphor for the cosmic ocean that contains dreams and nightmares. Accordingly, the etymology of the Rosmarinus comes from sea dew or sea mist in Latin, and it's incredibly satisfying to see how separate elements intersect into an even larger theme within the undercurrents of the game. I mentioned in another video that the term used for calling phantasms invertebrates comes from nantai dobutsu, which can literally be broken down as a soft-bodied organism, or more colloquially, as a mollusk. With the majority of mollusks being marine animals, it deepens the connections of phantasms and great ones being linked to the sea. Of course, not all mollusks are aquatic, with slugs and snails being notable examples. Nevertheless, the lake and sea runes give an explicit connection between water and the arcane. Neither the English or Japanese is very clear, but hopefully by comparing the two we can get a better idea of their overall meaning. Great volumes of water serve as a bulwark guarding sleep and an augur of the eldritch truth. Overcome this hindrance and seek what is yours. A large amount of water is a rift that preserves sleep and is therefore an augur of the arcane. Once in search, aim beyond it. These descriptions hint that in order to access the arcane, one must go beyond water which serves as a kind of barrier between worlds. There are a few allusions to this kind of imagery used throughout the game, but it's still pretty abstract overall. Perhaps the most concrete example of this comes from the DLC, where the fishing hamlet extends out from the face of the Grand Cathedral over the skyscape of Yarnum in the Hunter's Nightmare. If we look beneath the water of the fishing hamlet, we can see the hunter's nightmare below, but we cannot see the hamlet from the hunter's nightmare. This is also partially true in the Luminwood Garden, where the landscape of the Nightmare Yarnum resembles an ocean to the left of the entrance, though the right side appears normal. This may set the stage for the nightmares to be equivalent to a kind of cosmic ocean, and once the Orphan of Cause is destroyed, we can hear the fishing hamlet priest remark, Ah. Sweet child of Kos, returned to the ocean. A bottomless curse, a bottomless sea, accepting of all that there is and can be. If water acts as a rift or a bulwark that protects sleep, then going beyond it may bring one closer to the realm of dreams, nightmares, and greatness. The healing church believed as much, so they performed experiments on humans filling their heads with liquid so they may come closer to the Great Ones or attain eyes on the inside. The exact methodology for their experiments remains unknown, but it seems likely they may have tried a variety considering the differences seen amongst the research hall's patients. The more successful of the Healing Church's experiments were patients whose heads expanded until that was all that they were. Striking these disembodied heads can provide brain fluid, the descriptions of which provide an insightful glimpse into the goals of the Healing Church's research. The first brain fluid can be obtained from a head that's near a Healing Church hunter. It states it was extracted from a patient whose head expanded until that was all that they were. Once, a young girl had an older brother who was determined to become a doctor, and so she willfully became his patient. In the end, this led to their encounter with the Eldritch Truth, for which they considered themselves blessed. By this point, it should be no surprise that this reference to the Eldritch Truth comes from Shinpi, but another aspect of the description that was changed is that the Japanese calls it Yume no Yona Shinpi, or the Dreamlike Arcane. It's a fairly minor change, and it makes sense why they didn't feel the need to include Dreamlike before Eldritch Truth, since it may seem redundant, but I think this context is important when we consider how it fits into the description of the lake and sea runes. Since water acts as a barrier to the dreamlike arcane, the dialogue of many of the research hall's patients gains newfound relevance. Listen close, and you too will hear the sound of water. Have you heard how curiously the sea turns? Like a storm, but like the rain, only gentle, like dripping water. It bellows from deep inside of me. Here it comes, up through my inside, but gently, like little droplets. Oh, hello. 
Do you hear that? The sticky sound, as clear as day. Slip, slop, drip, drop, slip, slop. How extraordinary. Do you think that water drips even down deep below at the bottom of the sea? Can you hear it? Beyond the depths of water swirling and churning inside the patient's heads lies a path to encounter the arcane. It can lead to grotesque transformations, heavenly enlightenment, or even madness, but has a sane mind ever produced anything of true significance? In the end, the guidance Adeline received came to her in the form of a carol rune bringing the connections between the arcane, sound, phantasms, and water full circle. One aspect of the arcane I haven't yet mentioned is its association with eyes and obtaining eyes on the inside. Though Adeline became an enlarged head patient and presumably lost her eyes, she was able to see the shape of her own carol rune inside her head. The second brain fluid description explains more. In the early days of the healing church, the Great Ones were linked to the ocean, and so the cerebral patients would imbibe water and listen for the howl of the sea. Brain fluid writhed inside the head, the initial makings of internal eyes. There's something interesting I'd like to bring attention to in the final paragraph in Japanese. And as for brain fluid, it's an attempt to attain eyes inside the head. It is said to begin through writhing. Depending how the final sentence is interpreted, it could be saying that writhing is the beginning of either eyes on the inside or brain fluid. It's ambiguous as to whether brain fluid really does become eyes on the inside, but if we compare how Adeline sees a voice inside her head after consuming brain fluid to the imposter doctor situation after the blood moon, there are some remarkable similarities. If eyes on the inside generate through writhing, it would align very well with how the imposter doctor has the Erden writhe rune if she's encountered before the red moon is revealed, and how both she and Ariana can produce a quarter of the eye. It doesn't have to be interaction with Erden that produces internal eyes, though. Exposure to the arcane alone may be enough to produce them. It's unclear whether Adeline truly did obtain eyes on the inside, but in the case of Ludwig, it's abundantly clear he's obtained eyes on the inside, though the guidance he received doesn't seem to have spared him from a grisly fate. The arcane sword he wields can channel the abyssal cosmos, and it's probable the exposure to it or the carol rune he discovered caused his transformation and gave him eyes on the inside. The greatest indicator of eyes being connected to the arcane comes from an unlikely source. In the cathedral ward, there are a few patrolling church servants that carry lanterns. If the hunter has less than 15 insight, the lanterns appear normal, but with 15 insight or more, the lanterns themselves gain eyes. Additionally, the servants who wield them will be able to perform arcane attacks. Since lanterns are made from inorganic materials, we can conclude the eyes they have are products of the arcane. With this in mind, we can turn back to characters like Adeline, Yosefka, and Ariana and correlate the eyes or revelations they've gained with the voices of Carol Runes and Great Ones like Erden. Is it then possible that the voices of Great Ones can grant one eyes on the inside? Mikolash seems to think so, though to be fair, he never specifies how exactly he believes contact with a Great One like Koss would grant them eyes. Aside from Koss, there is another example of a Great One granting metaphorical eyes on the inside with the brightest the daughter of the cosmos. According to the Irun, it's a transcription of the Left Behind Great One's voices, but it's worth noting that singular and plural isn't often made clear in Japanese, and the Augur of Abritus's description makes it clear that the Left Behind Great One is a singular reference to Abritus. Abritus's voice inflicted Willem with the Irun, giving him at least a metaphorical eye on the inside, if not literal ones. If Mikolash's prayers to Koss aren't misguided, and she truly did grant eyes to Rom the vacuous spider, then this would make at least three cases of contact with Great Ones resulting in eyes of some kind on the inside. The same principle may then be able to be extended to the Nightmare Newborn Murgo. When the School of Mensis made contact with Murgo, it resulted in the stillbirth of their brains, but it's never really been clear what that meant. I mentioned briefly in my video about 20 insightful differences in the Japanese version of Bloodborne that there are a few discrepancies in the descriptions for the living string and the third umbilical cord obtained after defeating Murgo's wet nurse. The term used for stillbirth comes from Deki Soko Nai, which means failure, defective, or not fully formed. This term appears in the living string and is used to describe how the evil eyes of the brain of Mensis are completely malformed, though it was cut from the English description. That, in addition to the possibility that the brain was literally gained while in the nightmare, 
rather than already existing and being retrieved from it, could mean that the chance encounter the School of Mensis had with Murgo could have inflicted them with evil, malformed eyes which caused their brains to become malformed or stillbirthed. Normally it would be near impossible to describe the mechanics of how such an event would occur, but it could be a byproduct of Murgo's crying voice. Considering how sound can be imbued with arcane power in traverse dimensions, we can assume that since Murgo's cries are able to be heard in the nightmares as well as the waking world, the nightmare newborn is an infant great one. The school of Mensis may not have been the only ones affected by Murgo's cries. Throughout the nightmare of Mensis, there appear to be eyes lining the walls and floor. There are no proper explanations for them, but since they appear to have legs, they may have been insects that underwent a sudden metamorphosis after hearing Murgo's crying voice. It might sound absurd, but it should be noted the man-eater boars in Murgo's loft also have an obscene number of eyes. Compared to their cousins which breathe poison, these boars can inflict frenzy with their breath, showing that they harbor large amounts of arcane energy within them, along with having so many eyes. While it isn't guaranteed that Murgo's cries transform them, it seems the most plausible explanation based on what we know of contact with Great Ones and being granted eyes on the inside. As I said before, it took me months to realize how pervasively Shinpi was used within Bloodborne, so to a certain extent, I don't blame the translators for missing it. On the other hand, it's unfortunate it wasn't translated consistently, as I believe it would have made the game more cohesive. Ultimately, while the true nature of Shinpi and the Arcane might remain a divine mystery, it has additional meaning as a mechanic in the Bloodborne universe. To conclude, I hope I've been clear throughout this video on what's conjecture versus what's supported by evidence. My conclusions don't have to be taken as fact, and even if there are civil disagreements, I hope what I've shared will enrich the discourse surrounding the game. Rather than injecting my personal view of what Shinpi is, I hope I've shown what Shinpi is in, and from that, others will be able to draw their own conclusions. As always, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please consider liking it or subscribing to my channel for more Bloodborne-related content in the future. Fear the old lore.